Uh, welcome to the third program of the Whalen Historical Society in uh, conjunction with the Whalen Free Public Library. Uh, thankfully, Courtney Michael has um, been uh, uh, cooperating with us to do the programs together, and it's just a, a wonderful thing for us at the Historical Society. Um, we, this is the third program of our season and on a glorious fall day. So welcome to everyone who has decided to uh, watch this now and hear Jane uh, talk about uh, three Whalen women who were the first um, whale, uh, World War I yeoman, F, um, meaning female. Um, just a couple of words about Jane, because she'll tell us much more about that, is that uh, she is a Whalen resident, uh, well known in Whalen as um, an expert historian, but I have to say that she's well known wider than Whalen. She has been called um, several times to do the uh, slavery program that she did uh, last March um, in Weston. She's doing that next week or two weeks away, and she's done it in Sudbury and a couple of other places. And this program is a uh, part of work that she did for the Park Service. She was a um, interpretive National Park Ranger uh, for 20 years and uh, worked mostly in Concord, but she had been called to do this um, for, at the, I think at the Navy Yard, but she'll tell us more about that. Um, she has been, for the Historical Society, she's been president, curator, and definitely expert historian. Thank you so much, Jane, uh, for coming and sharing your expertise with us. And Courtney, I can't thank you enough on behalf of the Historical Society and the, the Friends of the Library and Whalen um, residents for your expertise and interest in these topics that we've been able to um, collaborate with. Thank you. Thank you, Gretchen. Um, it's my pleasure, really. This is the, one of the best parts of my job. I just wanted to say welcome from the Whalen Library and also thank you to Jane and the Historical Society for partnering with us. I think it benefits us all and we get a wider audience, which is wonderful. I just have a couple of notes. Um, first, this program is being recorded, as you probably heard when you signed on, um, hopefully for a broadcast on Wacam, Whalen Cable Access Station. And also we will have it on the libraries and probably the Historical Society's YouTube pages. I think Jane will be presenting for about 45 minutes, don't quote me on that, and then we'll have time for questions. So feel free to enter your questions at any point in the chat and I will read them aloud when we get to that point or you're welcome to unmute at that point and ask your question of Jane directly. So again, thanks to Jane and the Historical Society and now we will stop talking and hand it over to Jane. Well, thank you both um, Gretchen and Courtney who have been a wonderful support to me and really I couldn't do it without you guys. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, this program really is to commemorate, as I understood it, uh, Veterans Day, which is coming up this week. And I, I'd like to dedicate it to my father and other members of my family who uh, are veterans. Uh, I can't claim that we had any women veterans in the family, but nevertheless, uh, they certainly uh, served uh, when they were called upon to do so. So if this was in person, I'd ask you to raise your hand uh, if you had ever heard of uh, the first women in enlisted women in the military, what is known as Yeoman F. And uh, if your answer, I don't, of course, I can't do that because we're not in person. But uh, if your answer is no, uh, then it is the same as mine was in 2019 when I was asked by an old boss and a longtime friend, they were one in the same person. And thank you, Maria, for <laughs> tuning in uh, at Boston National Historical Park to research them. So interest in Yeoman F was sparked by the upcoming centennial of women's suffrage and any connection that they might have had uh, to it. As many of you might know, I spent most of my time in the uh, 18th and 19th century and very little in the 20th century, except so this was a real departure for me. And um, except for the latter half of the 20th century, which I lived through. so. 
but knew very little about the first half. So I had a lot to learn. Uh, few biographies have been written about Yeoman F, but the aptly named the first, the few, the forgotten, proved extremely helpful as the groundwork laid, as was the groundwork laid by the Boston National Park Rangers. I had a list of 200 Yeoman F at the Navy Yard to work with. And I am proud to say that I just about doubled uh, that list. So I'm pleased for that. So let me address the few for a minute. Uh, in total, uh, about 11,000 women throughout the country served in the US Naval Reserves as Yeoman F. And approximately 1,000 worked at the Boston Navy Yard uh, now part of Boston National Historical Park and commonly known today as the Charlestown Navy Yard. Uh, three women who served had ties to Wayland and more will be said about them later in the presentation. Yeoman F, F is for female, were the first enlisted women in the United States military. Their service in World War I was made possible by the Naval Act of 1916, which created the Naval Reserve Force. While women were barred from joining the regular Navy, the Naval Reserve Act did not specify uh, gender. <laughs> so, uh, the, and provided a toehold, really, that's all it was, uh, for female participation as yeoman, which was the Naval term uh, for clerks. Uh, to qualify, these mostly young women had completed four years of high school. Uh, some had attended college level secretarial schools. Very few had graduated from a college, but very few people did back in that uh, time period, although Wayland's Francis Glover and several others had. Uh, Black women were excluded from the Naval Act of 1916, although I have recently seen a photo of 14 African-American women who served in Washington, DC, uh, out of a total of 1,874 who worked there. To be accepted, the women, all volunteers, had to pass not just a physical examination, but a skills test. Their designation was often listed as stenographer, technically proficient, and if you're a young person, someone will explain to you what that is, uh, technically proficient in shorthand, a method of rapid writing using abbreviations and symbols for dictation, which was typically dominated by men into the 20th century. In reality, yeoman F were also responsible for typing, bookkeeping, filing and payroll, which required copious paperwork. Some even branched out to become radio and telephone operators, electricians, and draftsmen. The rationale for their service was to enable men who would otherwise perform these duties to fight overseas. Yeoman F did not work overseas, but in Navy yards throughout the United States. All enlistments ended on October 24, 1920, although many had been discharged after the war ended in November of 1918, and many continued their positions uh, at the Navy Yard as civilian employees. The women were enlisted just as men were, doing many of the same jobs, receiving the same pay, subject to the same military regulations, wearing similar uniforms and required to meet the same standards of performance. And they did receive naval benefits such as uh, veterans preference and uh, in civil service jobs and burial in military cemeteries. The Naval Reserve Act was enacted before the United States entered the war, but the hiring of Yeoman F did not go into high gear until the United States joined the Allied forces on, no, on April 6, uh, 1917. 
just as the Navy had to prepare for enlisting, training, and equipping troops to serve at sea or abroad, it also had to learn how to deal with the female gender in their midst in Navy yards in the States. According to the historical view of the Yeoman F published by the Naval History and Heritage Command, uh, just as the Navy did not plan for assessing women's physical fitness, they did not know how to handle physical exams. There was no preparation for their training, housing, or uniforms. Many lived at home and commuted to work. Some lived at the YWCA or rented rooms in private homes. The young women who worked at the Charlestown Navy Yard came primarily from large working class or lower middle class families, mainly Catholic uh, in urban areas uh, in and around Boston, many of whom had migrated to America only a generation or two earlier. Before enlisting, the future Yeoman F had already shown initiative by finishing high school at a time when less than 50% of both males and females did so, according to the University of Chicago study. While many of the women were too young to have worked prior to enlisting, some did leave their jobs uh, to enlist. Uh, in addition to helping the war effort, uh, enlistment offered equal pay for equal work with their male counterparts, a rare opportunity for women workers. The pay varied between the different classes uh, based on skills levels according to ex and according to experience. A few women entered as chief yeomen, the highest often working for officers, but others as yeomen first, second, or third class. A few were landsmen with minimal experience. At a time when less than 25% of American women, especially married women, worked outside the home, the yeoman F stepped out of traditional female roles and joined an emerging trend of women becoming clerical workers. By 1920, almost half the clerical workers and 92% of stenographers in the national workforce were women. I would venture to guess that their outstanding performance in the service contributed to this. Most of all, World War I and yeoman status provided these female military pioneers the opportunity to showcase their skills and education in support of the war effort. Praised for their patriotism, their service as yeoman F had provided many new and exciting opportunities for these pioneering women who not only re represented the first enlisted women in the US military, but the first generation of women who would benefit from the 19th amendment, giving them full citizenship and the right to vote. But they also experienced ridicule, insults, and demeaning comparisons with real soldiers and sailors and were often accused of enlisting to find husbands or make more money than they would in comparable civilian jobs. Not warriors in a traditional sense, the Yeoman F needed considerable stamina and a fighting spirit to face and overcome the challenges for women in a rapidly changing country a skill which undoubtedly served them in good stead as they went through life. And although not within the scope of this program, I might add that the Yeoman F who served had to cope with a pandemic. Um, so we know what that's like, uh, the influenza outbreak of 1918. Calling them yo girls or yeomanettes, these young women were poked fun at in newspapers and accused of seeking favors from male officers. 
Uh, here's one example in the newspaper of a uh, yeoman F shutter over nest of mice. Uh, so uh, today we wouldn't find that very politically correct, but I think they thought it was entertaining. So the word was quickly passed was the upshot of this headline around that the animal most dreaded by women had been discovered in their midst. The story lost nothing in the telling and as usual, the number was greatly exaggerated. As a matter of fact, only three were found, but it made a, a fun newspaper article. According to a historic view of the Yeoman F published by the Naval History and Heritage Command, everyone did not welcome their patriotism. Parents' beliefs about soldiers' behaviors and character made them reluctant to support their daughter's decision. This was probably less so in military families. Uh, male sailors felt skeptical about women's contributions and feared they would disrupt the workspace and reduce efficiency. A retired colonel stated in an editorial uh, that noted, preposterous, first women wanted to vote, then Alice Roosevelt started them smoking cigarettes. Now they're talking about being soldiers. Next thing we know, they'll be cutting off their hair and lo and behold, wearing pants. Uh, so, uh, they were in 1919, 114 women. Uh, Yeoman F who worked at the Charlestown Navy Yard were presented with distinguished service medals on account of neatness in uniform and prescribing to the regulations regarding dress. And since they had to provide their own uniforms, I suppose pride in, the military pre in their military presence was a big deal. Doubtless it was meant as a great compliment to those women, although today we might regard this honor with a more dubious eye. In any case, the Yeoman F were often seen in uniform, raising funds, selling Liberty bonds, and later greeting returning troops. And I have not come across any medals for well-dressed males. All the negative attitudes about the Yeoman F seem to coalesce around their inclusion in a state bonus bill when a state bonus bill of $100 was granted to male veterans in 1919, the Yeoman F petitioned the state legislature for inclusion. Approximately 1,200 women signed the petition. Representative Benjamin Young of Weston, who, was also who also represented Wayland, voiced the opinion of many of the state rep reps, all male, of course. The purpose of the Committee on Ways and Means was to bring out a fair and honest bill. He would not dare go back to his constituents and say he favored giving as much to those who served and suffered little as those who had risked and suffered all. And the Boston Post had this to say, the Yo women or Yeoman F as they call themselves, uh, that's not true. The capital letter standing for female are making a great hullabaloo over their claim for equal recognition for the $100. They are pretty girls, but their critics declare they are not in the same class uh, with the war veterans and that it is an outrage to yield to their demands, that they are nothing but clerks employed in an office in Boston with no more war risk, suffering or responsibility than common civilians and that it makes a mockery of the sufferings of the real sufferers to grant equal recognition to such trumped up merit as this. A majority came to the conclusion that they are as impudent a collection of strikers for cold cash as ever lobbied or intimidated a legislature. 
Besides, there was a huge economic issue by adding women to the bill uh, would be an ex additional expense for the Commonwealth. Were women worth it? Did they need a bonus if they were mainly dependent on a man, most likely a father or husband? In reality, a sizable number of future yeoman F were already contributing to the family coffers before the United States entered the war. After much debate, the yeoman F were not included in the 1919 bonus bill, nor in subsequent attempts until 1924, the next presidential election, but now women could vote uh, for president and state and local officials like uh, our representative Young. Uh, in fact, President Woodrow Wilson, for a long time opposed to women's suffrage, had his mind changed by the participation and outstanding performance of women in World War I and cites their war efforts as a reason to give women the vote. Born at the end of the 19th century into a rapidly changing world that included the dawn of aviation, the transition from horse-drawn vehicles to automobiles, the crusade for suffrage, and ultimately the right to full citizenship not long after the war ended, these young women undoubtedly used the skills acquired as military pioneers for the rest of their lives. Whether it was the Roaring Twenties, the Great Depression, World War II, where some saw their sons go off to war, and in many cases, well into the second half of the 20th century. Uh, that was the case with our three yeoman F uh, with ties to Wayland, and I would now like to tell you a little about their lives in addition to their war service. And I, I'd like to stress too that, um, that I believe that a lot could be added uh, to their lives. This is what I had access to, but if anyone has any information on these ladies, please uh, pass it along to me. Uh, so the three Whaling women, these are not the, uh, they are not Dora Copley McCarthy, but I, Selenia Wells or Francis Glover, but um, it obviously is an attractive picture that makes the point. The only one of the three that I knew about until recently was Francis Glover, who was listed in the Whalen 1920 town directory as a yo woman in the United States Navy. Scans for military, Massachusetts military are at the Commonwealth Archives and they confirmed that the other two had served. Uh, so uh, this is one thing that I found that, uh, yes, so this is what I discovered at the Historical Society was a list and it's undated, sadly. Uh, the, the Wayland American Legion post uh, the Charles B. Alward Post uh, 133 of Wayland, Mass. And uh, Charles Alward is one of four uh, Wayland men who uh, died in the First World War. He was the first one uh, to lose his life. But anyway, uh, on this piece of paper are the names of Francis Glover, uh, Selenia Wells, and Dora McCarthy. And in front of it, it's very uh, tiny lettering. You can see uh, that it says that they were all yeomen. Uh, so the American Legion uh, was formed in 1919 and opened to veterans who had served honorably as soldiers, sailors, and Marines for the duration of the war between April 6, 1917 and November 11, 1918. The, as enlisted women in the Naval Reserves, Francis, Dora, and Selenia could join, and they are all uh, on this list. Um, so uh, you can see uh, that, if, you know, this I just discovered at the Wayland Historical Society, and both Francis, I, and we also have the American Legion records, uh, the first meeting minutes, 
uh, at the Historical Society and both Francis and Selinia were members of the Whalen Post of the American Legion. Uh, Francis served as the first historian and both Francis and Selinia were active on the entertainment committees in its first year. Uh, the three Whalen women enlisted at the very end of the war during the Marne Offensive, the first in a series of coordinated Allied counter offensives on the Western Front. Uh, this would prove to be the beginning of the end for the German army, although at the time uh, no one knew uh, that this was going to be uh, the end. So uh, here is, and they were very actively, uh, even that summer of uh, 1918, uh, they were very actively recruiting um, uh, people to join. And here is the ad, Battle Brings in many recruits, largest volunteer list since June 5th, many boys of 18 among the day's total of 236. And here are on July 16th, 1918, the record of the 10 new yo women, including Frances Glover Whalen. I also noticed that she's the only one that doesn't get uh, an address. Uh, the, the others have street names, but she uh, did not. Uh, so, uh, so they were certainly old enough to have enlisted earlier in the war as many other women did. And I do not know why they decided to enlist when they did while their service was brief, although they had no idea it would be. They all qualified for veterans preference in civil service jobs, burial in military cemeteries and admission into the American Legion when the war ended. And here we're gonna start with our first and that's Dora McCarthy. And this is a scan of her service record. And that is what is at the Commonwealth Archive. Each, uh, each woman uh, had a scan and very nicely in the middle of the pandemic, uh, when I contacted the Commonwealth Archives to go in and look at them, uh, they told me, tell me who you want and I'll send them to you. So these are the scans that I received. So Dora, I had never come across anything that stipulated, Dora McCarthy was very interesting to me, that married women could not enlist, but in reviewing almost all 500 women, Dora McCarthy, and her name was, uh, was the first time I had encountered someone who actually was married when she enlisted. Uh, it was more common that somebody actually uh, leave and uh, resign when they got married. Except for her marriage status, Dora was similar to most of the young women I researched in Boston, coming from a working class background with grandparents who had immigrated to the United States. She was born Dora Coakley in 1891, uh, the only one of the three women who was a native of Wayland. In the 1910 uh, federal census, Dora was listed as a servant, uh, specifically a cook, in the home of a well-to-do Wayland family. She wasn't uh, living at home. But by 1917, Dora was a nurse in Boston. This is most likely how and where she met her husband, Daniel McCarthy, a window trimmer and Boston native. Uh, who enlisted in the U.S. Army as a private in the Hospital Corps 8th Regiment shortly after their marriage. And so here is a picture. So Dora lived in several uh, different uh, places uh, along Main Street in Kachichuit. Uh, during her time, her last address, so presumably uh, with Daniel serving somewhere other than Boston, Adora was back in Kachichuit at 6 Main Street uh, near the Natick line, although somebody, um, and I think the Kachichuit diehards for their incredible uh, efforts in trying to locate because the house is no longer in existence and someone thinks it was near the um, Hannah Williams Playground. 
Uh, so uh, she was back living with her mother and siblings at 6th Main Street, although, I, as I said, she lived in other places in and around Main Street. Uh, her father, who had worked in a shoe factory, was no longer living with the family. And still, she was working as a nurse. Perhaps Daniel was in Washington, D.C., as that is where Dora went to enlist as a Yeoman F and where she served. So she did not serve at the Charlestown Navy Yard. Dora first served as a Yeoman second class, but was promoted after three months to Yeoman first class, as she must have improved her skills significantly a uh, showing initiative that may have propelled her from servant in 1910 to nurse in 1917. Dora and Daniel had a son in 1925 who later served in the U.S. Navy during World War II, which was his mother's branch of the service. Uh, Daniel worked as a window decorator throughout uh, their married life, mostly in New York City, and Dora like so many married women, was not employed, as far as we know, outside her home. Yet no doubt her enterprising spirit enlivened the lives of her son and her five grandchildren. Uh, unlike Wells and Glover, there, was no new, there were no newspaper articles about her except for a notice of her death in Detroit in 1974, most likely on a visit to her son and family. I almost wonder if she was helping to take care of one of the children. Uh, and here is her notice. That is how we know. Uh, while Dora was included in the list of Wayland World War I veterans on the World War I American Legion roster, she never returned to Wayland to live. Uh, now we'll move on to Selenia Wells, and this is hers. Uh, and again, you see that she was a landsman. I'll talk more about that, so we mentioned her uh, skill level, but she was the youngest. Uh, the others were in their late 20s, where Selenia was uh, 21 years of age, uh, gives the dates of their service. Uh, she was the last to enlist in September and only uh, served for a short time. But Selenia had, uh, whether Selenia had crossed paths with the last of our uh, Wayland Yield women, uh, Frances Glover, uh, she certainly did at the American Legion, but whether they knew each other before that, uh, is, I have not been able to determine. Uh, and whether Frances had any influence being uh, older, on uh, Selenia's enlistment. In May 1919, uh, both Frances and Selenia uh, were listed as patronesses of a charity event in South Boston, uh, so they certainly were working together at that time, one that Frances had been associated with even earlier. Although born in Boston, Frances and her Okay, so... Okay, so Selenia uh, lived um, at 18 Winthrop Road. Uh, her primary residence, as I said, was in Cambridge, but her grandfather was a noted uh, Wayland native, Willard Austin Bullard, owner of Kirkside and president of the Cambridge Savings Bank. It is believed that the home she lived in as a child in Wayland, uh, 18 Winthrop Road was built by Bullard uh, for Selenia's parents, uh, his daughter Amy and her husband, uh, Herbert Wells. Selenia's co uh, connection to Wayland takes us back to the days when Wayland served as a country retreat for affluent families from Boston and Cambridge, especially after the railroad reached town in 1881. After the war, Selenia must have spent time in Wayland as she was a member of the Charles Alward Post, uh, number 133 of the American Legion. In the 1920s, uh, Selenia had relocated to Carmel Valley, California with a woman named 
Helen Lyle, also from Massachusetts, where they organized and ran, uh, and ran what was called a branch or riding school. Selenia lived the rest of her life in Monterey, California, and died there in 1989 at the age of 92. There is a news clipping, and this is how you know. And it showed up for, I have no idea because Helen Lyle nor Selenia lived in uh, near Springfield, Massachusetts. They lived in the Boston area. Uh, but she, uh, but here is the announcement, which uh, certainly verifies that she is indeed the person uh, that I was looking for and that uh, she even did register to vote out in California. So she did uh, do suffrage. Uh, so, um, so as I say, I don't know what the connection between uh, Francis and Selenia was, but uh, Francis is our last. Uh, entry and although born in Boston, uh, Frances and her family inherited a farm purchased by her widowed grandmother, Sarah, in the first years of the 20th century. Uh, and this is the Arthur Derby Draper House uh, at 101 Plain Road and it is uh, now demolished. Uh, so these Glovers actually would own the property. Draper owned it for a very short period, but the Glovers would own the property for 40 years, and Frances continued to live in Wayland with her family until her marriage in 1937. Uh, and here is her scan where she started as a yeoman a second class. She was the first of the three uh, to enlist, but wound up as a yeoman first class. Um, and um, Unlike many of the young women who became Yeoman F, Frances lived in comfort uh, with a live-in housekeeper, graduated Radcliffe College a few years after her sister Margaret, and devoted her life to charitable endeavors and her love of singing and plays. After her service in World War I, Frances is listed as a clerk for the Red Cross, but also can be found singing at its fundraisers as well as for the Waltham Hospital and other organizations. And in particular, there is a, a love that she had. I'm trying to, but she was from that area in Boston, but she uh, spent uh, so many years of her life connected with something called the Little House, uh, even before her enlistment and even after her marriage, uh, she in South Boston is, was similar to a settlement house uh, founded and run by women, providing social services, job training, educational courses, summer camps, and entertainment for neighborhood children and adults. And again, Frances was always in the forefront, staging plays and singing to raise uh, needed funds uh, for worthy causes. Closer to home, Frances was one of the organizers of the little theater group at Wayland's Volks Theater. And Frances was there for her sister, uh, Margaret Ames, who had also remained in Wayland with her family in 1935, when Margaret's husband, uh, an experienced yachtsman, was washed overboard in the North Sea in a race from Newport to Norway. Their two sons, there were only those were their only children, a rush to rescue their father and all were lost. Francis was accompanying Margaret to Europe to greet the yachtsmen on their arrival in Europe, but learned en route that they had all died. It fell upon Francis to break the news of their tragic fate to Margaret. Uh, this is very close to her family all her life. At 47, however, Frances married a prominent Bostonian, Charles Rogerson, who also had a commitment to charitable endeavors. He was the founder of the Greater Boston Community Fund. And here is an announcement of their marriage, which I love almost 20 years after her service as Yeoman M. F, look how far women had come 
in getting recognition for their accomplishments. So here you see a uh, Frances Glover, daughter of Mrs. Charles Baker Glover of Wayland and the late Mr. Glover uh, became the bride of Mr. Charles M. Rogerson of Milton. A ceremony took place on Plain Road uh, at the bride's sister's house at Mrs. Uh, Ames's house, Margaret's uh, uh, in Wayland. And then the rest of that announcement is all devoted uh, to Mr. Rogerson, never, uh, whose late wife was the former Miss Helen Campbell of Brooklyn, New York. Uh, and he is the son of so-and-so. And he graduated Harvard, even though she graduated Radcliffe. Uh, that is not mentioned. Member of the Eastern Yacht Club, the Milton Club, the Harvard Club of Boston, and the Appalachian Club. And then we go on uh, not to hear about Francis, but his daughter, Miss Margaret Rogerson, Martha, who will be married on June 19th to Mr. James Estabrook of New York. And his son, Mr. John Rogerson, will marry uh, Miss Jean Porter on July 6th. Uh, his other sons are Mr. Philip Rogerson, Mr. Robert Rogerson, and Mr. Alexander Rogerson, and so much uh, for Frances. Uh, but after her marriage, Frances uh, moved to Milton, and she is the only one of the three Wayland women that I do have a photo of. Uh, so this is from the Boston Globe. Uh, in 1944, shortly before her husband died. And so she moved to uh, Milton and still pursued her charity uh, work as Mrs. Rogerson. Uh, and then after, uh, after uh, Frances's husband died, uh, her mother, also a widow, her sister Margaret, uh, they all moved to uh, Castine, Maine, uh, to live out their lives. Uh, what united our three Wayland women, uh, the, our three Wayland women, the Yeoman F, and the 11,000 women who enlisted and lived out their lives as the first generation of women with full voting rights, to my mind, is their courage uh, and persistence in pursuing the boundaries of women's achievements often facing adversity and ridicule. They were the proverbial toe, that's all it was, in the water for all of us who followed. The first, the few, the forgotten, and hopefully a little less forgotten today. And again, if you have any information on any of these uh, women, uh, I would love to know more about it. So thank you very much. Uh, Okay, I can take it away, Courtney. Thank you so much, Jane. This was fascinating. And thank you for making their stories known again. Um, I am, if anyone has a question, please feel free to unmute or type something in the chat and I will read it aloud. Um, I have a sort of um, contextual question. So these were the first enlisted women. And then um, was there sort of a lull before the next world war? Do you know? Um, yeah, the next, the lull would be the, the World War II. Uh, the next ones would be World War II. As far as I know, Maria can correct me because she's the expert. Um, but um, it, it, one of the things I want to give a shout out for another book, which is called uh, Maria's agreeing with me, but anyway, I wanted to give a shout out to another book that's really uh, fabulous. It's called The Hello Girls. If anybody's heard of it, I highly recommend it because these were women who actually did serve in World War I overseas. Uh, they were on the front lines uh, manning the, the communication systems, and uh, they thought they were working for the Army, not the Navy. And they actually thought uh, that they were enlisted until they went and the war ended and they went to get their benefits and found out that they didn't have any uh, because they were not enlisted. So here's yet another story uh, that of, of how hard it was uh, and, and what, what these women sacrificed 
in order to be able to uh, to prove themselves that we all now accept women in the military. I hope we all accept women in the military. But this was this was and and as I say, they're the first generation of women with full uh, voting rights, and they also have. Um, they they have a whole life to live that is uh you know as these women who who stepped out of the box so you know i i, I you can argue how uh how instrumental they were to the war but in terms of pathfinders uh, for women in the military i think they certainly deserve their due thank you um, we Oh, sorry, go ahead. Did Maria want to chime in? Well, Someone wants to chime in. Oh, I think it was me, Gretchen. Go ahead. Okay, um, I just, I think I might have missed uh, this. In the very beginning, you said that they did or did not have a salary, the first yeoman. Yes, they, uh, they were given they were uh, the same salary as okay. men who did comparable work. Yeah, because that later was, yeah. That Later you well, said that, and I thought there was something else before that they well, were volunteers. Oh, okay. I know what you're saying. Volunteers, they were not drafted. Ah, oh, okay, fine. Thank you. That, that, I'm sorry. Thank, um, that's right. Thank you. No, no, no. I, I understand. I understand why why you said that. Um, but yes, they were not drafted. They were uh, they were not recruited um, in in the way that men were recruited. They uh, volunteered to become yeomen. But yes, I, I was a little hesitant to that uh, when I said that and realized it might cause confusion. And I'm very grateful to you uh, for helping me to clear it up. Sure. So Jane, we have a question from Catherine. Were there different ranks among the yeoman F? Yes, there was the the chief yeoman was the highest and they all got different uh, salaries depending on their experience. And then there was the uh, yeoman first class, second class, third class, and then uh, the landsman per yeoman who really had uh, very little skills to begin with. But yes, you could be promoted and, and uh, so both Selenia and, um, and Francis were promoted. Uh, I think that uh, Dora was, I'm sorry, uh, was, and not, not Selenia, I beg your pardon. But anyway, um, yes, depending on your rank, you would get uh, more money and, um, and it would be the same as a man doing uh, the same job, which was very, very unusual. Mm. And did any, could you be promoted beyond yeoman or that was the top? For no, one? that's it. You were a yeoman. <laughs> <laughs> that was the toe. You got the toe in. You had to wait for the Second World War to get uh, more than a toe in. <laughs> and there was no husband's auxiliary for the yeoman women. <laughs> 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 there, there was, there did, some of the American Legion posts uh, did only uh, have women in it. Oh. Um, yeah, and, and some of the women actually started uh, an all women's, some of the women from the Navy Yard uh, started an all women's uh, post in, in Boston. It may have been the only one in New England for quite some time, but um, yeah. And then, and then you see in the uh, American Legion in Wayland, as soon as they got the auxiliary, um, I, I see less, I don't see uh, any longer Frances uh, being as active as she had been. This is not my area of expertise, so I don't want to give misinformation, but it was just an observation from looking at their records. I wonder actually if you could talk about all the different kinds of records and places that you use to do this research. Okay, well, the, the scans itself are the, um, the scans themselves are at the Commonwealth Archives. Um, very kindly, thanks to uh, Boston National Historical Park, I had uh, access to the 
uh, to the Boston Globe archives. I signed up for two free weeks, <laughs> one <laughs> under my husband's name and one under mine to newspapers.com and tried to pull as much as I could about the, but these were the Boston women. And then in doing this, uh, research on the Whalen women, I actually signed up uh, to Genealogy Bank because uh, the Boston Globe at that time was considered the uh, the Democrat paper, the lower uh, <laughs> echelon newspaper and the Republican newspaper, which was the Boston Herald, which is covered by Genealogy Bank, had information about Francis and Selinia because they were women uh, who had much more means than the average. So I did sign up for that uh, as well. And then of course, anything that the Boston National Historical Park had they sent along to me, so. And are the naval records at the State Archive? Uh, the, the, the military records are at the State Archive. Okay. They actually were until right before I started this project, they <laughs> were in Concord, Massachusetts. Oh. <laughs> in the armory there. And um, right before I started the project, uh, they moved to the state archives, not my favorite place to go, but I sure did. Uh, but this time they really didn't encourage me to come there and they were the ones who looked up the scans for me. That's great. Another question from Catherine, were all the women single? Well, except for Dora McCarthy um, was the one person that I found that was married when she enlisted uh, out of a total of, I would say over 500 women that I uh, had looked at. I, I, you know, I did them on, oh, and you also wanna know what else did I look at? Ancestry, most definitely, which gave married names and when they married, uh, cause I also did look into whether they were married or single and several women that I came across who resigned upon their marriage while yeoman, but Dora is the only one. I'm sure there are others, but uh, she was a, you know, a revelation to me. Uh, there was no law that prevented a married woman from, uh, from enlisting. It was just unusual, I think, because uh, most women do not work outside the home. Mm. Maria is sharing that there were also a handful of widows. Oh, yes, there were. I did come across widows. Yes. Thank you, Maria, because yes, I did. They definitely, there were widows who had uh, children, uh, young children, and uh, usually they had a family member, uh, mother, grandmother, whatever, uh, who would help out or family, as I say, a family member who would help out with the care of the children. But yes, she absolutely, I I came across with us. Um, I'm wondering about the wages. Was it, uh, so you said they got paid the same as the men of the same rank, which is uh, refreshing, but was that a, a living wage? Was that a good wage? That was a good wage. Um, I, I have the somewhere and I don't recall the numbers, but I do have the numbers uh, of their pay. I think it was a, a decent uh, wage, uh, certainly. Uh, and as I say, it was higher than they would have made in comparable jobs in mm -hmm. civilian life. I can I can certainly tell you the wage and send it along to you, Courtney. If people want, <laughs> if people want to know uh, what they made, I I can pass that along once I put my hands on it. Sure. And um, one share from Susan, she said, 25 years ago, I attended the dedication of the Women's Military Memorial. One of the speakers was a World War I Navy Yeoman F, and her son was a Navy commander. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so, so they actually formed a National Yeoman F uh, organization in 1936 or 7. Uh, they actually were incorporated by Congress, the federal government, and they disbanded. Uh, in, in fact, one of the women that I had studied from the Navy Yard, uh, they disbanded uh, in 1986 because there were so few of them left 
and the ones who were left were not in, uh, the, they were on in years because they all came or were born somewhere around the, the end of the 19th century in order to be yeoman. Uh, F so that they were petering out substantially by uh, 1986. And one of the women who did work at the Navy Yard uh, arranged and even uh, funded uh, a Yeoman F uh, a, a artifacts to go to the um, to the Smithsonian and her uniform is there and other artifacts that were used by Yeoman F. Wow. That's great. Does anyone have any more questions? Feel free to unmute. I will tell you, I have copied this, Gretchen. I have copied um, all the links that were in the chat. So I, I don't know how that is saved, but anyway, they are here on a document. <laughs> Thank you, Gretchen. Yeah, we'll send that with, along with the link to the recording. We'll send that to everyone. So they can share. Thank you. Yeah, I want to say thank you again to Jane for all of this work and for putting it together in such an understandable and succinct way. And um, thank you again from the library. And I'm sure Gretchen. Yes, <laughs> everybody could unmute and un and start your video. And we could all clap together. <laughs> can we do that? <laughs> oh, you can't start the video without the host. But anyway, we can all clap. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Jane. It was Excellent. great. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you. Jane, thank you. Thank you. You're thank welcome. You, My really pleasure. Really thank you. Everyone have a great afternoon. Thanks, Courtney. Bye. Bye. Bye.